Today we're going to talk about different sorts of medical imaging, what medical imaging can tell us about the brain, and how research at the New Zealand Brain Research Institute is using this technique to investigate Parkinson's disease and other disorders. Our speakers are Dr. Tracy Melzer and Dr. Mustafa al -Makbel. So we're not jumping to the MRI yet. Uh, I think we'll have a quick look at the medical imaging as modality, then we'll jump to the MRI wall. So I thought what we're going to talk about this morning is maybe what is medical imaging and why do we do it? And maybe I'll introduce, introduce you to some of our tools and then we'll dive into the uses and applications of the medical imaging. So, what is radiology or image or medical imaging? Basically, it's one of those medical specialties that involves exploring the inside of our bodies. So we are the good people. We don't cut, we don't like scissors or things. So we try to see what's inside our bodies without openings as, as much as we can. And of course, it needs some knowledge of human anatomy, physiology, and pathology. So it's a good idea if you want to do any imaging to know where the liver is, where the brain is, where the shoulder is, as opposed to just like dive haphazardly. So, and as, as you would imagine, it needs and it uses technology like computers and things. So if we look at this image, so this is a person's chest and abdomen. Let's say we want to see what's inside it. In the very, very old days, the surgeons will just cut and see what's inside it. And if you can see there, there's a green thing there, that is the gallbladder, right? So in order to see why this person got a pain in his stomach, they will need to cut, right? But because we are the good people, we don't like to do that. So we use medical imaging to see what's inside the body. So in this particular image here, we're, we're imaging mainly the abdomen here. So this structure here, this gray structure, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse. So this is the liver and this is the right kidney. And this is the left kidney here. But this is the spinal column here. It's a bony structure, so it's brighter. And these are the pelvic bones, right? So we could acquire this type of images in under five seconds, right? So it's very quick imaging and it tells a lot of what's inside our body without any incisions or anything. So that's what medical imaging is all about. And by the way, this is an image of CT scan or computer, computerized tomography. It's not like an X-ray. It uses X-ray, but that's what's so-called uh, CT scan. Let me see if I can put my pointer. Uh, yeah. Hopefully that will make your life easy to follow me. Right, so yeah, it's a, so it's a very quick way to see what's inside the body without anything. So, uh, come. right, so why do we do medical imaging? Why do we do it? It's very easy. We, clinicians likes, like to make diagnosis. So if someone comes with symptoms, let's say pain or headache or something, they would like to know what's causing that one. So in medical imaging, that's where we jump in and say, okay, we can dive in the shoulder or the knee joint and see what's going on there. We try, most of the time we do it non-invasively without injecting or making any cuts or anything most of the time. But in certain occasions, we do, we do inject or do something to the joints, right? We'll, we'll touch on these ones later on. But basically the main idea is to make diagnosis. Now, how do we do that? Right, if we take this lady as example, this lady presented with headache. She got headache for a few days or a few months, but no one knows why she's having it. So if you talk about headache, it's a very broad area. So a lot of things could give you a headache. Uh, there are some primary reasons that could give you a headache, such as stress, if you skip meals, or you're just sitting in the wrong way all the day, or you just miss up your sleep. So this could give you a headache, but 
what's so special about these type of uh, causes? These causes, if you sit with your physician or GP and you sit face to face, they will ask you a few questions. Say, hey, how was your sleep, sleep over the last few weeks or so? And are you stressed? Are you changing job? Are you moving out? Da, da, da. So all of these little things, and they could pull out. They could pull out a lot of information, and maybe work with you to reduce the stress, or and then hopefully the headache will go away. But this is only part one. Part two that could give you headache is what so called the the biological or the the other changes or pathological things that could happen inside our bodies. For example, you could have tumor or struck or infection or aneurysm. Aneurysm, by the way, is just like a damage to your blood vessel muscles, right? So if you have some of these ones, I don't think the physician by just sitting face to face with you, they will do some physical examination and there are, they are clever people, but usually they would love to get what's so-called evidence-based evident, evidence -based thing. So they would like to see it there. Okay, so what is the size of this, this tumor? Where is it located? Can we do a surgery and take it, remove it? Or can we do radiation therapy? And so they will need to, to get more details. And here comes the rule of medical imaging. So we can image these areas and give them more information, size, location, what type of tumor is this one? So a lot of information can be gathered in one imaging session. So that's, that's how we help in the diagnosis. Now, if someone get the diagnosis, hopefully correct diagnosis, precise diagnosis, then the clinicians will set the treatment plan. That could be medication, surgery, radiation therapy, or whatever, but you need to land on diagnosis first. And I think a lot like blood tests, medical imaging playing a big role in this, in this aspect in terms of making diagnosis. Now, uh, tools, we have, a lot of tools to make diagnosis in medical imaging, a lot of them. Uh, we call them imaging modalities. So in, a, in each radiology department, you'll find ultrasound, X-ray machine, CT scan room, magnetic resonance imaging, and positron emission tomography. By the way, uh, don't worry about these terminologies, but I mean, positron emission tomography, Tracy, my colleague later on, will, will touch on it. So MRI, this is me and Tracy doing it on a daily basis and we'll, we'll take some examples on how can we use these modalities in making some diagnosis so the list is very long but these are the common ones you find them almost in every single hospital now let's take x-ray as an example so this image here so this lit little cylindrical thing is is the x-ray tube that is the thing that generates the x-ray so when you when you are trying to image someone's hand, what you do, you get the x-ray tube here, which sends the radiation or the x-ray that penetrates the hand or the body organ we're examining, in this case is hand. Then what happens, uh, what happens our tissue will attenuate or weaken the, the, the x-ray. So only some of the x-ray will arrive to the detector or the film, right? So based on our tissues, if you have a bone, which is really dense, it will attenuate the X-ray with much. So then if you compare it to the soft tissue here, your skin, it will attenuate the, uh, the X-ray with a lesser, to a lesser extent. And this will give you a radiograph or kind of just a picture of what's inside your body. So basically, if someone comes with a question of a bone fracture, we will do this kind of X-ray to them. And then if there is a fracture, you will, feel, you will find it as a, a line in here, a dark line maybe. So that's how the x-ray works very quickly. And from the name, it, it, it requires or it uses x-ray, which is we need to use it very carefully because if you use it excessively, it, you, might, you may harm yourself, right? So that is one example of using one of the imaging modalities. Uh, example two is the medical ultrasound or sonography. <clears throat> I'm sure it is known for examining pregnant ladies. So what's happening, this is some, a lady, a pregnant lady, Tommy here. This is the ultrasound probe or transducer which sends the ultrasound waves or the sound waves. And so basically the way it works is, so this is a baby by the way inside, this is a real picture of a baby inside 
mom's tummy. So this is the face in here. So this baby is lying on his back in this particular image. This is the head here. That's the head. Nose in here, lips in here. So that is the chest area and that's the abdomen. These are his fingers. I think he's making a fist if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, so the way it works. So this uh, transducer sends w sound waves inside the tissue. And we know that the babies are surrounded by fluid. So what happens if the waves hit the fluid, they go back, bounce back and register certain signals here, right? And goes back to the computer. If they hit the body, a denser body tissue, the same, they hit back. So what happens? Based on the density of the tissue they are facing, they will register some signals. Then the computer does its magic and will construct this type of images, right? So basically, there is no x-ray here. It's really safe. They use it for pregnant ladies. They use it for a lot of other examinations, uh, like young kids and things. So it's really good and it's handy. It's available in, in most hospitals nowadays. So let's take this example. So this is again, that's a, a picture of a baby. This is the head here. That's the back, legs, and I think that's his hand. Maybe he's sucking his thumb or something. So what happens? This is called the driving baby. Someone clever got this particular baby's picture and they just animate them. They turn into a movie. Let's see if I can play it. Uh, okay, it doesn't like it. Play. No, it doesn't like it. Anyway, so that, that was supposed to play. Let me see if I can play. No. Yeah, it's not liking to play. So that, that all right, there you go. Right. So this baby decided to move and he was just mimicking like a driving person. So someone clever and put it all together. So we call this one the, the driving. So the idea behind this is we can not only see shapes, we can see motion and not behaviors, but some physiological things. So let's say if that baby cannot move their legs at certain age, that it would be alarming sign to the clinicians, right? So we, we, we see them real time and see their behavior, right? So that's the, the main idea behind this. Now, jumping to my favorite MRI, I mean, imaging modality, which is magnetic resonance imaging. I'm not going to talk about the physics whatsoever, but what I can tell you, MRI is regarded to be the one-stop shop which means you could scan maybe head to toe, all parts of the body, and you can, tell, you can gather information about the muscles, the joints, the brain, the blood vessels, bones. Uh, you could gather a lot of information. As long as you are willing to stay in that machine, it's a very noisy machine. Some people, they don't like it because kind of a cylindrical, cylindrical shape. Some, some people consider it really confined and a bit scary, but yeah, we use it on a daily basis. So basically what I'm showing you in here, this image to the left is a cartoon of someone's chest and this is the shoulder joint here and that's the neck area. So if you would scan someone's shoulder, you will get an image like this to the right. So this is the, the bone here, anything in the gray are is the muscle, anything in white, that is the skin in here, right? So we can see the cartilage, the, the ligaments, and if you are a tennis player, most likely you came across injury, so then you'll we'll just image to see what, what did you do to your shoulder, right? So in one scan, this will take around three minutes of scanning and you get super detailed information about what's inside the shoulder without injecting or doing anything bad to you. So that was example one from the MR. Uh, example two, uh, so the image to the left is the knee joint, cartoon of the knee joint. So this is the bone of the thigh, this is the bone of the leg, and that's the kneecap here. And the things in, 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 in yellow are, is the fat. So this fat is really important. This is keeping our joint kind of cushioned, right? And that's the skin behind the knee here. So again, if you would scan someone, you will get an image like this with MRI. This will take around two and a half minutes and you get all of this information, right? Whether you have rheumatoid arthritis or you, got, you have torn a ligament or you've, you've ruptured your muscle, you will see it right away, right? So it's really, really kind of 
on-demand modality because all, with all of these sport injuries or aging issues, we can spot it in the MR. And it's very short. Nowadays, it's becoming really fast and fast imaging modality. And this is my favorite brain. So as you uh, have known already, our research institute is focused on the brain imaging. So we do a lot of brain imaging and we use MRI on a daily basis. So the image to the left is just showing a face or like a brain, but image to the right is one of the images we gather every day. So basically here is the nose of the person, lips, forehead, that's the skull here, and that's the neck area. But in here, that is the brain tissue and there are great details here. You can tell the difference between different tissue types, right? I'm not going to details, but Tracy hopefully later on will touch on some of them. But this will take roughly about five to four minutes to acquire this type of images. And we can get a lot of information. It's not only the shape, I'll touch on this one. So we are so greedy. When we scan someone, we get a lot of information. So what's good about MRI, it does not use x-ray radiation so we could scan you for a good hour and gather a lot of information the good thing about it is you could take different planes so the image i showed you previously this was side to side ear to ear imaging we go side to side but mr allows you mri allows you to go and slice the brain into kind of transverse sections so if you follow these red lines you will get images like these two in here so this gives us better visualization to see if there's any pathology or anything. So the image to the left is good uh, to, to pick up pathologies. For example, if there is a tumor here, you will see it right away. If there is a missing part or you were born with a missing part of your brain, you will spot it right away, right? So the same imaging session, we don't stop at this one to image to the left. We always acquire these, the other type of images there, which is, good to, to tell us the, about the uh, uh, type of tissue, which is called, called the white matter. It's really good to see, to show you white matter pathologies. One of the common diseases is the MS disease. It's really common, so we use this, this type of imaging to pick up MS every day. So basically, this will take around two minutes, this will take about three minutes. So you will get a lot of information in one imaging session, no radiation whatsoever. Right, so that's the beauty about MRI. You could use multiple planes and different flavors. So that's why I call them flavor. They do look slightly different, but each one will tell us different type of information. Now, as I mentioned, we are greedy people. So we don't only gather the information and put them on the shelf. We gather information. So we gather this type of, collect this type of information, but Tracy and his clever team, what they do they do what's so called quantification. So in this particular scan, the image to the right, Tracy decided he wanna quantify the cortex of the brain. So the outmost layer of the brain, he wanna see how thick or thin is this cortex. So they got a lot of software and a lot of years to do. So in the clinic, they will gather this type of images, they will come to the research center, and they will start quantum. So they convert these images into numbers. Why this is helpful and important. Let's say we've scanned someone today and we got uh, a feeling of his cortical thickness and it, has, it happens to be 50, let's say 50 millimeters, right? But then if the same person came two years later, we could do exactly the same procedure, the same scanning and quantify it and compare two years ago number to the today's number, and we can hold that comparison and say, hey, have you benefited from this medication? We have given you exercise or medication. So it's really important to get numbers as opposed to visual things. So that's what, what Tracy and his team is doing. They convert these numbers and give them to clinicians in a, a meaningful way to change medications or change treatment plans and things. So that's, that's the main focus of, I mean, that's one of the, areas Tracy and his team focusing on in the research center. Uh, we have a lot of other uses and I'm nearly done and I'll hand it to Tracy soon. Uh, so we have other uses. So the image to the left is an image of someone with a big tumor here. So you don't need to be expert, but if you compare this side of the brain to this side, this side looks a bit messy and there's a like a dark spot here where the brain structure are swelled. So this is a tumor 
which is not good for the patient. But the question, so we know about the tumor, but the question from the neurosurgery team came, came say, hey, how big is this UFA tumor? We have imaged this person before. Where are we at? Is it shrinking? Is it getting bigger? So what we did, we get the same person. We, we collected this type of information, but then we collected another type of information after injecting this person, uh, this person a dye. So we have injected this person something in their veins, and this highlighted the active area of the tumor. So what happens if you look at this image to the left and compare it to the image to the right, you will see a, a white ring. So this is the active area of the, of the tumor. So that's where, where there is still living tumor cells, right? So this is really important to the surgeon so they know where to attack when they wanna do surgery. So that's example of using so this is what we call minimal, minimally invasive procedure. We don't open cut, but we inject people sometimes some injections to make life easier. Now, in this particular image, the image to the left is an image I showed you before, which tells us about the anatomy and if there is any obvious pathology. But this particular person came with headache and dizziness, da da da, da a lot of story. So the question raised was, how is their blood flow going in the brain? Is the blood flow going smoothly? Is it homogeneous all over the brain? The, the answer came in the right side in here, no. Unfortunately, this lady got hypoperfuse or a reduced blood flow in her right side of her brain. So this, this, this gray area here is, is not receiving enough blood. So anything in color here indicates the blood flow. So the red areas are having more blood flow than the green areas. So the gray area here are not having enough blood supply, which explains her symptoms. So that is something else to look at. So what's happening to her blood vessels in the neck? Maybe there is a stenosis or something, right? So in one scan, which takes about five minutes nowadays, it will tell you about the blood flow again. We could, do, we could do all of these type of imaging in one imaging session. So in 45 minutes, you get all of this information, shape, pathology, flow, all of the other things, abnormality, like you, if, you were, if you were born with any abnormalities, we can spot it with this, this scan. Uh, in this particular one, I'll go quickly, the image to the left allows us to quantify the iron deposition. So we, we have, tissues in our body that are more susceptible to gather iron. So in certain diseases, you will have iron overload or the iron will be accumulated more than it should be, right? So this particular scan can allow us to quantify it and we can get numbers. So if you had iron overload, overload today and they have given you a treatment, if you come three years later, we could tell where are you at today in comparison to the, your previous scan. The image to the right is what's so-called functional MRI. So what we don't care about the anatomy here. We care about the functional centers in your brain. For example, the learning center, the memory center, the thinking center. So we could isolate and identify these centers in the brain based on some tasks that we can give you. For example, if I give you a book in the MRI scanner and I, in a screen, I'll give you mathematical uh, problems. Say, hey, go ahead, do your math. Uh, do all of these multiplication things. This will excite the mathematical center. So the surgeons, for example, would, okay, I know where is his thinking area. So if there is adjacent tumor, they could avoid it. They don't cut these vital centers. This is a very quick, maybe Tracy will touch on it later on. All right, I think I am pretty much done here. One last example from me. So this image here is basically, so this is the shoulder upper chest area. So this is this this are the lungs, the two black areas here, and that's the brain chopped into halves. We haven't so and that's the neck area. So, and in here we know the heart is just living in here, our heart, which bumps the blood to the right and the left of the body, right? Now, so this is a static, not moving image. What we can do if we are interesting to to image the blood vessels, we could do what's so called. Uh, uh, vascular imaging, right? So in, in the image I'm about, or the movie I'm about to play, it will show you what we do. We inject the dye in the vein and we start 
imaging and we see a real-time blood flow into our bodies. This is very important because we could pick up a lot of pathologies and stenosis and aneurysms. And so I'll play it and I think that will be my last exam. So blood is coming into the heart, feeding the carotid arteries. So it's real life, it's kind of a movie. If there is any abnormality, you will be able to see it. If there's any bleeding, you will be able to see it. And this takes under a minute of scanning. So that so there are a lot of uses for MRI, depends on the question. We do certain type of imaging. And I think I will stop here. Tracy, please take over. Thank you. Uh, okay, excellent. Hi, uh, I'm Tracy Melzer. Uh, I am a, a research fellow at the University of Otago here in Christchurch, and I'm also the MRI research manager here at the New Zealand Brain Research Institute. So I do have a message, and that message is, if you have any questions for Mustafa, or if you have any questions for me after I'm done speaking, please feel free to put those into the Q&A section, uh, and then both Mustafa and I will get to those uh, once I finish and we can answer some of those questions. So, uh, great, thank you Mustafa for a very nice introduction to medical imaging in general, uh, the different types of images, uh, and specifically talked a little bit about MRI, um, which is what I will be focusing on today. And I think just to, actually, what do I have coming up? Right, so just to reiterate um, Mustafa's point, I think there's two important things about MRI in particular. One of those things is that it's safe and non-invasive. So what we mean by that is that we use no ionizing or damaging radiation. That makes it safe and non-invasive. But I think the other thing which uh, Mustafa alluded to is uh, MRI's flexibility. And what I mean by that is by slightly adjusting some of those parameters when we're doing the scans, we can create a whole host of those different images. And Mustafa showed you some of those. And those range from images of structure, function, blood flow, uh, a whole range of different things that we can measure within a single imaging session. And we use all of that information in our research here at the NZBRI. Um, and I'm specifically going to talk about how we use that for Parkinson's disease. But before I do that, uh, I do have just one or two more examples um, of uh, some brain images. So these are, let's see, what are we gonna be looking at? We're going to be looking at a structural scan. And we're gonna be looking at a structural scan, which um, as if we were to slice the brain and look down on the brain from above. So you'll see I have some, uh, some uh, indicators here. Front is the top of the screen and left and right. So we'll go through this um, to begin with. Okay, so we can start so here, bought at the neck, coming up through the nose. Here you can see the eyes. Uh, coming up through the middle of the brain and working its way towards the top of the scalp here and up and out. So what we've seen is basically starting at the bottom of the neck and then moving all the way up through. Now this next example is scanning from side to side. So what we're doing is we're starting here and we're going slice by slice all the way through the brain. So um, this time take a look, see if you can pick out the ear, the eye, the nose, and then take a look at what the brain looks like. Um, and here we go. So we're coming in, uh, just entering the brain. As you'll notice, here is the eye. Here's the mouth, the tongue, the nose, um, and then coming out through the other side of the brain. I'll just play that one once more. And this time, have a look for the spinal cord. So you can see, if I stand this way, you can see the spinal cord coming up, and I will try and indicate that here. So coming into the brain from the side, and if we're looking down here for the spinal cord, we can see it come here up to the brain, and you can see the beautiful folds in the rest of the brain. Okay, and so we can obviously not just look at brains as slices. Uh, we actually acquire the entire brain, and we can create these beautiful models uh, of the brain. Um, and so what I've done here, this is actually an image of my brain. Uh, and what I've done is I've made a slice down one side of my brain. So you can look in and you can see uh, the, the beautiful folds in the cortex. Um, but uh, you can also see that I had my eyes closed during the scan. You can see ears quite well. Um, obviously, you can't see hair. There's no signal from hair. But you can also see some vessels here 
um, coming into uh, my brain. So it's a great imaging technique. Um, right, so I think I'll just very quickly run through and say, uh, again, this is just re re reiteration of what Mustafa already told you, was that with MRI, we can measure different things. We can measure blood flow, the blood flow that arrives to the brain. We can measure the health of white matter tissue. Now, white matter tissue is really important because it connects different regions of the cortex. The cortex is what we call gray matter. It's on the outside of the brain. That's where a lot of the thinking and the processing happens. And so for different regions of the brain to communicate, they need to send messages to each other. And they send messages via these white matter pathways. And we can look at the health of those white matter pathways with MRI. And we can also look at function. So we can look at which areas of the brain are specifically active during tasks or when we're performing, and we can see if, there's a, uh, if they're not working quite as well as we would hope. And there are many other types of MRI. Uh, right, so I think um, today what I'm going to do is I'll just uh, skip over positron emission tomography, come back to that if you have some specific questions. Uh, but right, so what I actually wanted to do was to tell you how we're using MRI to look at Parkinson's disease. Now, uh, you probably have heard of Parkinson's disease, and maybe that's through uh, these two individuals, whether through Muhammad Ali or Michael J. Fox. Um, but you may also be familiar with Parkinson's through a friend or family member, and, we, and that's a very real possibility here in New Zealand. We uh, have about 12,000 uh, um, patients who are affected by Parkinson's disease. Now, Parkinson's disease is normally classified by, as a motor um, disorder or a movement disorder, um, and we're familiar with their characteristic motor symptoms, which are a resting tremor, a slowness of movement, and balance difficulties. And these can all contribute to a negative quality of life for these individuals. But we now know that many participants with Parkin or patients with Parkinson's disease will go on to develop some sort of cognitive impairment. Um, and this can actually then become the most burdensome aspect of the disease. In fact, many of these patients actually go on to develop a full-blown dementia. And so over the past decade, there's been a real interest and a focus placed on the process of cognitive decline in Parkinson's disease. So how do these patients develop dementia? When do they develop dementia? And what's actually happening in the brain to cause the development of the dementia? So specifically, we're able to identify patients who are showing very early signs of uh, thinking difficulties or cognitive impairment. We call this mild cognitive impairment. And the idea is if we're able to identify these patients who are showing these early signs, can we select them out and put them into new treatment trials, uh, which aim to slow or even stop that cognitive impairment. But currently, we don't have the best methods to actually identify those participants, those, those patients, those who are at highest risk of developing dementia. And so we think that brain imaging could help us in that, in that regard. So really what we're setting out to do in a lot of our work here at the NZBRI is to use brain imaging, uh, take pictures of people's brains, look at those images, and try and see if we can pick up any signs or signals within those images which give us information about who's at risk of developing dementia and who's at risk uh, and who is not at risk of developing dementia. And the idea there is those who are at risk of develop developing dementia, we can put them into new treatment trials. Those who are not at risk, we don't have to submit to those new drugs or new therapies which may have some side effects. So that's really where we're coming from. And we think that brain imaging may be able to give us a bit more information about the brains of, of people with Parkinson's and specifically what's happening as people develop uh, early signs of impairment and then later dementias. Right, so the way that we've done that here in Christchurch at the NZBRI is through our longitudinal Parkinson's study. So this was a study which actually started back in late 2007, uh, where we re recruited 300 Parkinson's patients and 64 controls. So the controls are healthy individuals who do not have Parkinson's disease. Um, and so what we've done over this time period is we've uh, performed a large assessment, a neuropsychological assessment, so tests to look at thinking and um, um, their psychological status. Uh, we've also looked at behavioral assessments, clinical assessments. Um, we've also taken blood to look at um, uh, biomarkers, uh, what we call, or looking at genetics and how that affects 
or is related to cognitive impairment in Parkinson's disease. Uh, but we've also acquired uh, MRI scans and more recently PET scans in these individuals. And the really exciting thing that we've done is we've actually able now been able to follow them every two years. So we're starting to gain uh, a better picture of what's actually happening in the brains of patients with Parkinson's disease. And I'll just uh, reiterate that this is, this is actually quite an achievement. This is one of the largest studies worldwide, especially uh, over that long um, time period where we're up to now 10 years. So this uh, equates to over 1,500 clinical and cognitive assessments, over 650 MRI scans. And as I said, we're really actually not starting to get a, a little bit better picture of what's happening in Parkinson's disease. Uh, so given time here, I might just skip over this, uh, positron emission tomography, and we can come back to that if we have time or if you have specific questions about that. But what I'd like to do specifically today is talk about what we're seeing with our MRI um, scans. So probably the best demonstration of, what, um, of, of how we're using imaging is if we look at the most extreme case. So that is looking at individuals with Parkinson's disease who have actually developed dementia. And that's what I'm uh, displaying here. So if uh, I'll put the pointer on here. Right. <clears throat> so what we're looking at here is a represent representation of what we're finding. And I've displayed this on a horizontal slice. So if you, uh, again, slice the brain this way and look down from above, that's what we're looking at. So uh, what we have here are, uh, is the tissue, the tissue volume, gray matter atrophy. So what you're, you're looking at here, here's the front of the brain, back of the brain, left and right. And essentially what we're looking at is any areas here in blue and green indicate significant loss of tissue. So significant atrophy, people are actually losing brain tissue here in Parkinson's disease with dementia relative to healthy individuals. And so you can see this is occurring in a number of different areas in the brain, and these areas correspond to specific aspects of uh, thinking and memory and cognitive difficulties that we see in dementia. Now, if we move to the middle uh, image here, what we see is we're looking at blood flow here. So once again, blue and green now indicate significant loss of blood flow to the brain. And you can see this is actually much more extensive. And this is essentially covering the entire cortex and some subcortical areas uh, where we see this reduced blood flow in the group with dementia relative to healthy individuals and, and those Parkinson's patients without dementia. And lastly, over here uh, on the far right, we're looking at white matter damage in Parkinson's disease with dementia. Now this is slightly different. So um, in green, this is what we call the white matter skeleton. So this is looking at the centers of principal white matter tracts. And remember these white matter tracts are the, uh, um, are the pathways which are connecting different areas of the brain. And any areas that you see here in red are actually indicating significant damage. So we're seeing damage to the white matter in the group with Parkinson's disease and dementia relative to both healthy individuals and Parkinson's patients without dementia. So what you're starting to see is, uh, is a picture here in dementia where we're, we have uh, loss of functional blood flow, we see loss of tissue, and we actually see damage to the white matter. Um, but the question then becomes, right, so if we can see this in Parkinson's disease with dementia, what's actually happening in, in, in patients who are just starting to show early signs of impairment or even patients with Parkinson's disease who are, are, are doing well in terms of what's happening um, with their brains? And so, again, with this longitudinal study, we have the ability to go back and look at trajectories and look at how are people changing over time um, and how does that relate to cognitive impairments. So um, I have uh, two examples for you here. So on the left, we have a structural scan. This is our high resolution um, research scan. This allows us to measure tissue volumes and specifically tissue, uh, cortical thickness. So this is looking, as Mustafa mentioned earlier, looking at the thickness of the cortex and uh, how that changes over time. And the reason that we're looking at this is because it's been shown to be a very robust measure of brain health. And so we can track that over time. Now, the other thing, um, the other type of image that we can look at, this is um, uh, what we call a T2 flare image. This image is specifically uh, good at looking at white matter damage um, in specific areas. So I hope you can see here this white matter lesion. You can see uh, it looks a bright white. We can actually identify where those are happening. Uh, and so we can actually add up 
how much white matter lead, how many white matter lesions do we actually see in the brain? So two simple metrics. We're looking at the average thickness of the cortex across the brain, and we're looking at how much white matter damage, how uh, the volume of these white matter lesions in the brain. And what does that look like over time? And how does it relate to Parkinson's disease? So this is the most complicated plot that I could put in the um, presentation, but I'll walk you through it. So what we're looking at here is actually now we're looking at uh, total gray matter volume. Sorry, we're not looking at thickness, we're looking at volume. So this is how much gray matter does a person have in his or her brain. Okay, so that's what we're seeing along the uh, vertical axis. And along the horizontal axis, we're looking at age. So starting here at 50, all the way up to 90. Now the top panel shows healthy individuals. So these are individuals who do not have Parkinson's disease. And along the bottom panel, you see Parkinson's disease uh, patients. And lastly, um, so each individual point represents an assessment. So that's both a cognitive assessment and an MRI scan. And multiple assessments within the same individual are connected by lines. So this person was seen at uh, 53, 54, and 57-ish. And color, lastly, indicates their cognitive status. So blue indicates a uh, healthy um, individual. Green indicates an individual who had Parkinson's disease and normal cognition. Orange, those with Parkinson's and mild cognitive impairment. And lastly, red indicates those individuals with Parkinson's and dementia. So it's, uh, people like to refer to this as a spaghetti plot because it looks as if someone took a handful of spaghetti and threw it onto the wall. And it does kind of look like that. But, um, but the main thing that you can see here, in healthy individuals, we see a slight decrease over time. And this is, this is well known. We know that as we age, we see a very slight loss of tissue over time, but this is again, completely normal and uh, expected for all of us. But the question then becomes what happens in Parkinson's disease? And what we were able to show is that if you look at Parkinson's disease uh, as a whole, specifically focusing in on those individuals who have Parkinson's and normal cognition, they're indistinguishable from controls. So they're tracking along the same as healthy individuals. It's once these individuals start to develop mild cognitive impairment and ultimately lead to dementia is when you start to see them uh, accelerating uh, and showing an accelerated loss of tissue. So we're starting to be able to describe what's happening in the brain and then what we see as an outcome. So how uh, is a person, person's thinking ability um, related to their brainstem? Uh, now, that was what it looks like um, uh, over um, gray matter volumes. This is looking at those specific white matter lesions. So here's an example from a single individual. So this individual entered our study um, uh, and had Parkinson's disease with normal cognition. Now, hopefully you can see these um, uh, white matter lesions. Now these are quite extensive. So these are already quite large. You wouldn't expect to see these in, in most participants. We saw them again two years later and we can see uh, slightly more extensive damage. And we then saw them um, four years later. Um, and by that time they had developed dementia. And so hopefully you can actually see quite uh, much more extensive white matter uh, lesions there. So the question then is, well, this is in a single individual. What does that look like uh, in multiple individuals? Uh, and sorry, I actually don't have that plot here, but what we can see is that seems to track as well, where uh, we see an increase in, in healthy individuals. Uh, we know that this is uh, one aspect of aging. Again, those patients with Parkinson's disease and normal cognition track uh, along with with controls, and it's those who really start to uh, show these further advanced signs of mild cognitive impairment and dementia, where we actually start to see an increase in these uh, white matter lesions. So um, let's see. Yeah, so I think I'll probably leave it there for today. Um, I didn't have a chance to talk about a lot of the other imaging findings that we have here at the Institute, but what I can say with this slide is just a summary. So we can look at um, a bunch of different MR metrics. We can look at chemical concentrations, functional connectivity, and even the deposition of um, misfolded and, and pathological um, uh, proteins in the brain. And we're actually seeing that those don't seem to be associated or at least very strongly with dementia and Parkinson's disease. We do have these two that I've talked about, which are showing nice, strong 
robust associations and give us a sense of actually what's happening in the brain in people with Parkinson's disease and dementia. But we also have a lot of other techniques which we're continuing to explore and which look very promising for giving us more information about what's happening in the brain, but we can't conclude um, one way or the other. So that's exciting that we're continuing to look at those. Now, uh, before I finish, I did just want to leave you with one um, positive note. So uh, sometimes it can sound a bit negative and a bit pessimistic when we're talking about healthy individuals as we get older, we're losing a little bit of brain tissue and that can be slightly uh, a downer. But I did want to leave you with some positive news. Uh, and that is how we can actually uh, help our brains. Um, how do we change our brains? And the answer to that is by learning something new. Uh, the simplistic answer to that is by learning something new. So this was a this is a, gr a great study. It was a relatively old study. Now the first time that they did it was in 2004, but they've repeated this in young people, in old people, in people with some sort of disorder, in healthy people, um, and basically we've been able to show the same same thing over and over. And that is how does the brain uh, respond to learning something new? So the first study that they did uh, was to grab a bunch of people. And they got all these people together and they scanned these people structurally to look at their brains. After they scanned everybody, what they did is they separated them into two groups. One group lived their life as normal. The other group uh, entered a regimen of juggling training. And so they were instructed on how to juggle and they practiced how to juggle with three balls uh, until they could master juggling and they could maintain the three ball cascade for a minute. And after they could maintain that juggling for a minute, everyone was scanned again, both groups. And what you're seeing here in yellow in these three different views are the results. And the areas here in yellow indicate which areas of the brain showed increased gray matter volume. So more gray matter tissue in the group that learned how to juggle relative to the group that didn't learn how to juggle, it was live their life as normal. So when this originally came out, the press got a hold of it and it exploded and they said, oh, these areas of yellow, we've identified the juggling areas of the brain. But obviously that's, that's not the point. The point of this is to say that you can structurally change your brain as a consequence of learning something new, right? And it doesn't have to be juggling, right? It can be, it can be anything. And so from there, you would imagine that things have exploded and people have looked at how does um, learning a new, uh, difficult cognitive task like how does sudoku change your brain how do crossword puzzles change your brain how does learning an instrument change your brain how does learning a new language change your brain uh, and so we're actually able to show our brains are what we call plastic they are um, uh, within a certain realm or a certain size we can actually change our brain so that was really exciting uh, and i'll leave you with that to say um, learning something new is um, fun but it's also good for your brain so I'll leave you there and, and just thank um, all of the people here at the Institute. Uh, it's a big team and everything we do is uh, multidisciplinary. Uh, we need lots of people um, and it's a great team to work with uh, and also a bunch of our funders. So thank you very much. <laughs>